Okay, welcome back everybody. So today we're going to start another new type of generative model, uh, which is going to be score-based models and then diffusion models in the next lecture, which are closely related to them. Uh, so it's going to be a new topic. We're almost done with uh, generative modeling families. This is actually, these two lectures this week are going to be the last set of generative models that we're going to be, the last set of new generative model families that we're going to be seeing. And then we still have some extra additional topics in the coming lectures. Okay, so I'll start uh, the, the, this, this new topic of score-based and diffusion models with, as usual, a quick, a quick recap of things we saw in earlier lectures. So first of all, in the first several sets of lectures, we saw a few classical types of deep generative modeling families. Uh, so we looked at our regressive models, latent variable models, and by that I mean both these and flows. And then we also looked at GANs as an alternative model which doesn't optimize the log likelihood like all the other models. Uh, and there's several sets of tasks that these models can do, uh, which, we, which we covered. Uh, it's, uh, for example, uh, so the, the, the most typical task that you, we wanna do is uh, generation, but also there's other related tasks in the field that we might be interested in, such as representation learning or density estimation for applications like outlier detection. Uh, so there's a wide range of tasks that these different models can do. Uh, now, some in, in, uh, in most cases, or at least for the beginning of the, of the class, for the first generative modeling families, we used maximum likelihood as our training objective. And this objective is, um, it's, a, it's, it's a very standard type of objective that we use in machine learning and statistics. But when we train using maximum likelihood, we usually have to deal with various types of complications. So for example, if we have latent variables in our model, then we have to worry a lot about how we can uh, approximate the likelihood, which is intractable in general. Or if we have a uh, bijective model like a flow, then we have to think hard about how do we ensure that the, uh, that the model is both invariable and has a tractable Jacobian. So there's a lot of thought that has to be invested in what kind of neural network can we use with each of these models. We can't just plug in an arbitrary neural net uh, inside a flow or inside, a, inside some of these uh, other models and expect it to work efficiently. We spent a lot of energy on, uh, with coming up, uh, 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 we spent a lot of energy coming up with different uh, architectures that fit these model families. And then towards the end of this block of lectures, we saw GANs, which don't use the likelihood and which can use an arbitrary generative process, an arbitrary simulator to generate samples. Uh, so they have the most flexible type of uh, the most flexible type of model that can parameterize the neural net. You can use any generator, any neural net that can output samples can be trained as part of a GAN. But the problem is because GANs are trained from samples using a discriminator, uh, and we're simultaneously maximizing and minimizing the objective with two different models. As a result, training is unstable. So GANs have flexible models, but they're unstable. And then in the last lecture, we looked at energy-based model, which is an approach where similarly to how, uh, well, it's even more general than, hmm, I guess it's comparably general to GANs in that, we, again, in a generative model, don't have to worry about what kind of parameterization we use for the neural net that parameterizes the model. Uh, we start with very few modeling assumptions, uh, but then we'd still train these models in the last lecture using maximum likelihood training using MCMC, which can be slow in practice. So with energy models, we came up with a modeling family that admits very flexible uh, very flexible neural network parameterization, parameterizations, but the cost we had to pay for this was that training is slow. So the question I want to ask in this lecture is, can we again, in some sense, get, a best, get the best of both worlds? 
can we have a very flexible neural network? Uh, can we use very flexible, very general types of neural networks to parameterize our models? Uh, can we be as flexible and as general uh, in terms of our modeling assumptions as in energy-based models? But can we avoid paying the cost of slow training and slow sampling using MCMC uh, like we did in the last lecture? That's going to be the topic that I want to start uh, this lecture with and that I want to use as motivation for the kinds of score-based models that we're going to look at. So let's, again, redefine some of the things we saw in the previous lecture. Remember that in the previous lecture, we introduced these energy-based models, which are very flexible, very general classes of generative models in which we define, again here, we define a probabilistic model P of X using an unnormalized function, using this unnormalized energy F of X. So we define uh, an unnormalized probability, which can be any non-negative function. Here it will be X of F of X. And then we explicitly normalize it by explicitly dividing the unnormalized density by this term, by this integral, which is what we call the normalizing constant or the partition function. Um, right, so previously, for example, in a flow, we were very careful about what kind of, uh, what kind of parameterization we would use for the model in order for the density to be tractable in order for this normalizing constant to be always tractable when we do the change of variables, right? We had to be very constrained in terms of what kind of neural net we can use to parameterize, for example, a flow model in order for this partition function to be tractable. Here, we take the opposite approach. We're gonna say we will use any model, any neural net to approximate and model the unnormalized distribution, and we will worry about the normalizing function later. It might give us a probability, uh, well, it might give us an unnormalized density for which the partition function is really hard to compute, but that's fine. We'll just take this approach and we'll deal with computing the normalizing function later. That's one way in which you can think about these energy-based models. So very general, but requires dealing with a potentially intractable partition function. So again, what are the pros and cons of energy-based models? The main advantage is, as I said, we can, is that we can use any normalizing function, uh, any, any function f for the unnormalized probability without, without any constraints on what f of x is. So that's great. That gives us a lot of modeling flexibility. However, as I said earlier, the partition function ends up in general being intractable if we don't have any constraints on what f is. So therefore, uh, computing the density is intractable, right? So just evaluating this p of x is intractable and therefore optimizing the likelihood is also intractable. So just the forward pass for computing p of x will be intractable. Therefore, learning is hard. And similarly, sampling from this distribution is also hard because we only have a weight at each data point. It's not obvious how do we actually sample from this unnormalized probability. Now, there are ways. We looked at MCMC as one way of sampling from unnormalized probabilities, from these kinds of, yeah, unnormalized probabilities. Uh, and then sampling can be, MCMC-based sampling can be used as a subroutine for learning. That's what we saw in the last lecture. Um, but in general, MCMC is still a slow procedure that in the worst case, you can come up with examples where it will take a very long exponentially sized amount of time to converge. So this is not, the, the approximate techniques we saw in the last lecture don't fully solve our problem, right? So in general, without any additional constraints on f of x, 
energy-based models can be intractable. As a result, we have to use approximations, similarly to how we had to use approximations when we worked with, uh, uh, with GANs, uh, with uh, VEs and, yeah, with VEs. Um, one type of approximation that we, tend, that, that we saw when we first had to deal with intractable likelihoods was variational inference. And vari variational inference is one of two main approaches to dealing with intractable probabilities in machine learning. It's probably the most popular one these days, but it's not the only one. Um, so another approach is sampling-based methods, which is what we saw at the end of the previous lecture. And these two approaches, so variational inference and MCMC-based sampling approximations, these are two really important classes of techniques in machine learning that are, you, that are very, very important. They're used throughout machine learning to approximate things when they become intractable. So we saw variational inference, we saw MCMC-based methods. Uh, in particular, we saw MCMC in the context of uh, energy-based models. And again, just to remind you how slow and complex this procedure can be, if we wanted to learn, to approximate learning, if we want to approximately learn an MCMC-based model, uh, sorry, an energy-based models using MCMC, then the procedure that we would follow would look like this. Um, so for each set of, for each step in our optimization procedure, we would try to compute this gradient of the log likelihood. But in order to compute the gradient of the log likelihood, we have to, uh, you know, we can't get the exact gradient because that would require computing the partition function. Therefore, we approximate this gradient by taking samples from the distribution and we use a Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, algorithm to compute samples from P of X. Then we use these samples to compute an approximation to the gradient and then we take a gradient step. But essentially, at every step of gradient descent, we have to run a Markov chain to take samples from our distribution, which is very slow. Um, but still, this is a, an approximation procedure that is worth knowing. Now, these are two approximate techniques that are trying to optimize the look like. What if, as in GANs, we try to not optimize the log likelihood, but instead choose a different objective? And maybe that would make things easier. So the idea that I want to explore today is, instead of relying on these two classical sets of techniques for approximating log likelihood, can we instead use something other than the log likelihood, which will not require us to deal with the partition function, and therefore, will be a better way of learning the uh, of, of learning an energy-based model. And so the answer to, to this to this, well, sorry, it's not a question, but but the I guess uh, you could probably see where I'm going. Uh, we're going to see a different way of training an energy-based model, which will be more effective than using MCMC in many applications. And as a result, it will allow us to learn energy-based models in a way that's more tractable and that doesn't require dealing with the partition function. Okay, so uh, this is the outline for the lecture. I will present a different way of learning an energy-based model using something called a score function. I'll start by defining what a score function is. Then we will look at how we can learn this new object called the score function using algorithms that are called score matching. Uh, so this is going to be about learning. Part one will be about representation. How do we represent a probability distribution using its score function? Uh, then how do we learn this score function? And finally, how do we do inference? How do we draw samples from this new object that I will define called the score function? That's the plan for this lecture. Um,
All right, so let's let's start. So first of all, what is this idea of score function that I want to use that that I'm that I'm going to propose that we're that we use? So the score function is to make it short. It's the score function is what is given to us by this little formula at the top of my slide. So the score function is the gradient of the log density with respect to its input, right? So suppose we have some, some density or some probabilistic model P of X, it's associated Stein score function is given by this formula, okay? So let's, let's stare at this for a moment and understand a little bit better what this means. The first observation I want to make is that this Stein score function is different from the gradient of the log likelihood, which is what we used earlier. Notice that the gradient is taken with respect to x as opposed to uh, with respect to the parameters theta, right? So if we were to use gradient descent, we would be using this particular expression. We would, we would be trying to optimize the model with respect to its parameters. Therefore, we would take the gradient with respect to the parameters, but that's not what the Stein score function is doing. Here, the gradient is with respect to x. <coughs> so what the score function doing is something different. The Stein score function points in, uh, it's, a, it's a gradient on x that instead of pointing in directions where we wanna move in the parameter space, it points in a direction of the input space, it points in the direction of the space of x, and it tells us where we should go to increase the probability of the x's that we're optimizing over. Right, so we're in the space of x. Here I have a two-dimensional example where uh, I have a probability distribution in two dimensions, and this distribution has two modes. There's one mode in the top uh, right, and there's a mode in the bottom left. And one of them is bigger than the other. And what the Stein score function is giving us is at each point of this two-dimensional space, right? My distribution is defined over two-dimensional x's. At each point, I have an arrow that points me in the direction where I have to go in order to increase, in order to go towards the, uh, towards region of the space of X where there's a higher probability, right? So it's a vector field that points me in the direction where I wanna go in order to get to a higher probability X. Are there any questions on the score function? Okay, the score function is another way of representing where the high probability regions are, not via a score for each x, but via a gradient field that tells me where I should move in order to reach the higher probability regions of the input space. Yep. And that would only depend on, that would only make sense if the theta themselves are meaningful. This is for a fixed theta. You have a model or a district probability that has, it may have, it may be parametrized with some sort of parameters theta. So for a fixed theta, I have, I have a score function. That's okay. Oh, yes. That's, that's what we use for uh, generating adversarial examples, this score function. Uh, well, this is what we use to generate a reset. You could use this to, yeah, you could try to fool a discriminative model by finding x's that give you the wrong class. I don't think it's quite applicable here. We have a, I think a, a, another serial example is normally something you define for a discriminative model, like a classifier. Here, it's a generative model. Um, but yeah, I guess if there was a y, it could be similar. Okay, so why is a score function interesting? Oh, well, okay, first of all, let me just give you one more example. So this is, Another example of how a score function might look like in, in uh, one dimension, 
here our distribution, oops, here my distribution P of X is a mixture of two Gaussians, which is the one dimensional analog of the previous example. And you can see that the score function, which is on this side, uh, it, it tells us roughly in which direction we should be going uh, in order to move towards a region of higher probability. So for example, this function is negative, which means that it points towards the left near the left mode. And so what I mean by this is that if we're, if we're somewhere here, then the score function is negative, which means that it says that we should be decreasing x. We should be moving, and we should be making x smaller in order to reach a place of higher probability. And similarly, when we're on the positive side, when we're on the right here, the score function is positive, which means that we should be increasing x in order to go to a point of probability that's high. That's just another version of the score function is in one dimension. This is the one dimensional analog of the previous example on the previous slide the example with the vector field. Okay, so why this is interesting? One of the main reasons why score functions are interesting is that they are independent of the normalizing constant or the partition function. Let's say that we have an energy-based model in, of the following form. This is, again, our standard definition of, the ener of an energy-based model. It has this intractable partition function z of theta. Well, if I wanted to, to compute its score function, then I don't need the partition function z of theta, right? This is my score function. And that's just the difference between the unnormalized energy and the partition function, the log partition function. But because this is, because the partition function is not a function of x, it's a function of theta, but not a function of x. Therefore, this is zero, and my score function is simply the gradient of the energy f of x. So this is really neat. This should start to look like something that we can use to learn the kinds of energy models that we found to be intractable or computationally hard to work with in the previous lecture. So the idea that we're gonna use in this lecture is that instead of trying to learn the, the, the probability P of X itself, instead of trying to build a model for the probability, which is given to us by this formula, which involves this intractable constant, Instead, let's not look at the probability. Let's instead try to build a model of the score function directly. And a score function is something that gives us a lot of information about a probability. Let's model it directly. And if we model the score function, then maybe we can get away with uh, not having to ever touch the partition function. And that's gonna be an alternative way of learning the of learning an energy based model because again recall that by by this equivalence here a partition function uh, uh sorry a score function equals the green of the energy function so they're closely related perhaps by learning a score function we could have a more tractable way of learning an energy based model So the idea of score function estimation will be the following. Here I'm going to precisely define the task that we're gonna be interested in. So our goal in this lecture and the task of score function estimation will be to learn a model of this form. We're gonna learn a model of the score function S of X, which is going to be a vector valued function going from r to the d to r to the d. So it takes as input a d-dimensional variable x, which you can think of as an image or 
the kinds of high dimensional objects we typically try to model in using generative models. And its output will be the score function because the score function is a gradient with respect to x, it will also be d-dimensional. Therefore, our model of the score function is a mapping from d-dimensions to d-dimensions. And the setup that we're going to be that we're going to be dealing with is that, as usual, we will assume the existence of some data distribution. In this case, I have the same two-dimensional data distribution that I used in my first example. Um, but as usual in machine learning, we don't have access to the data distribution directly. We have access to samples. Uh, in particular, we have access to IID samples from the data distribution. So these are the points that you see here in my other picture. And our goal will be to somehow learn this gradient, this, this vector field uh, from the data. And this vector field will, uh, so this model S of X will try to approximate the true score function of the data distribution. Okay, that's the task that we will be interested in. Um, so again, as usual, we have a data set. Our task is to estimate this uh, score function using, using a model of the score function. And in order to perform this task, we will need to define a few components. We will first of all have to define a model. Um, that's, that's something that can be really general. I will allude to this a little bit later. Uh, I will give you an idea of what the model can look like. But most importantly, if we are somehow to fit our model to the true score function, we need to have some objective and some optimization procedure, which will somehow make S of X close to the gradient of the log of, uh, of close to the true score function. Um, and so our first step in order to solve this task will be to define a, a learning objective for a score function. Okay, so let me just pause here and see if there are any questions about what are, what are score functions. And then after this, I will talk about score matching, which is how do we actually solve this task that I just defined. Each error represents the gradient of the log probability of the data where the gradient is taken with respect to the data. So the arrow is pointing in the direction where you want to go in order to increase log P of X, which means you want to move to a higher probability region. So now we have defined the task of score matching, or sorry, defined the task of score function estimation. Now, how do we actually solve this task? And that's going to be the, the goal of score matching. So score matching is a way of learning a score function, and it does so by optimizing a particular objective. So again, our data score and the model score are both vector fields. And so what we want to do is effectively match these vector fields, right? A vector field, as I said, is, is a function that define, you can think of it as defining an arrow at every point of the input space. And we want these arrows to match, right? So here in this example, let's say that I have, uh, I have an arrow here and I have the same arrow here. So this one is pointing in a slightly different direction from this arrow. So I want to make these two arrows more similar to each other, right? So this, the true data probability has an arrow that's pointing in this direction here. This one is pointing in this direction. So I'm going to try to massage it and make it more like the true gradient of the, uh, like, yeah, like, like, like the true grade, like the gradient of the true data distribution. So again, our goal, our, our, our goal is to match these two vector fields. How do we do this? Well, one natural objective is to simply define the L2 norm between each of these arrows, right? So again, at each point, let's say here I have this arrow, here at the same point I have this arrow. They're a little bit different. There are two vectors. So I can define 
the L2 norm uh, on the difference between these two vectors. And I can try to minimize this difference over all the points. And this is exactly what the Fisher divergence is doing. So here in the middle, like I said, I have the L2 norm of the difference between the true, uh, the true score function at a point X, which is a vector, and what my model is predicting. And I take the expected value of this L2 norm over all the x's that I see, over all the x's sampled over the data distribution. Therefore, it gives me the following objective. Right, so the Fisher divergence is literally just trying to minimize the average error between the model vector and the true data vector at each point x, where we're averaging across all the x's uh, according to the data distribution. That's what the Fisher divergence is telling us that we should do. So to put it differently, it's the average Euclidean distance between two vectors. Uh, and this is a valid objective. You can show that this is zero if and only if uh, the, actually this should say equal, if and only if the two distributions are, the two vector fields are equal. Okay, so this is a possible objective for us. Does anybody see any problem with this objective? What? You don't know P data, exactly. So we can't really use this objective because we don't know this true score function, right? So what can we do instead? Um, so score matching is a way of dealing with this problem that we don't know log P of X and much less its gradient. Uh, it turns out that there is a way of transforming this objective into something that is tractable by using a, per a particular trick called change your variables. And this gives us another objective called the score matching objective, uh, which was proposed by uh, Hevarian in 2005. Uh, this is an equivalent reformulation of the Fisher divergence that now no longer involves any uh, anything that's related to the true data distribution within the object, within the formula whose expectation we're taking. We still have the, the expected, we still have an expectation over X coming from the data distribution, but that's okay. When we have an expectation uh, uh, over the data distribution, we can approximate it using Monte Carlo, that's fine. But the integrand, does not involve any, anything that's, that looks like the true score function. So this is one approach that leads to a possibly, that it could possibly lead to a tractable objective. Uh, but this new objective now is tractable. As I said earlier, it doesn't involve any log likelihoods or any score functions in the integrand and we can approximate this expectation using Monte Carlo, as I said earlier, which just means that given a data set sampled from X, we approximate the expected value with an average over the data set sampled from P data. So now this gives us something that is starting to look like a practical objective for score matching. Um, I have here a short proof for how you can derive this objective in one dimension. Uh, and I think I will just skip this for now, uh, just in the interest of time. But the high level idea, so you're, you're welcome to have a look at this proof uh, asynchronously. Uh, you can download my slides uh, and, and look at them. But essentially this is going to be a change of variables trick where we start with the original Fisher divergence then we expand the uh, we can we we expand the different the squared difference into three terms. One of these terms is a constant, therefore it completely disappears. And then we can apply uh, integration by parts to rewrite this integral in a different form. Uh, so it's integration by parts, 
which I am working out here. And then this integration by parts transforms this term into a sum of these terms, one of which equals zero under some basic regularity conditions. And then you can check that this term and this term, when combined together, that gives us exactly what the other objective had. These are exactly the two terms that you would find in the other objective. And again, I'm going through this quickly. You can look at the proof uh, on your own in, in the slides. Just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Okay, so now we have a first potential objective that we could use for score matching. So we could potentially take our function s of x, we could optimize it using a neural net. And notice here, there's literally no restriction on what s of x can be. It's just any function from rd to rd. Unlike in a flow model, it doesn't have to be invertible. Uh, that makes things much simpler. So any neural net could theoretically optimize this objective. Uh, so we can compute this objective efficiently uh, using a, we can compute these the forward pass efficiently, and then we could try to optimize it using gradient descent. However, when we do this, we run into a complication. Notice that this term here has the, it involves the gradient of the score function. So the gradient of a vector valued function is a d by d matrix. And then we're taking the trace of this matrix, which means that we're taking the sum of its diagonal elements. And so now we have to backpropagate through this, uh, through this gradient. So we have to take the gradient of a gradient of a vector valued function. And this becomes computationally challenging. This can be seen as equivalent to computing uh, big O of D <coughs> backpropagation passes, right? So for each of these terms on the diagonal, which is a scalar, we have to effectively compute its gradient, which effectively means that we have to do a passive backprop for each of these terms. So our cost, the cost of doing backprop here would scale as big O of D. It will be big O of D times more expensive than if we had uh, a simple scalar output. And as a result, even though the score matching objective is computable, the previous Fisher divergence was not computable. Here it's at least computable, but it's not scalable enough. It's not, it's too, it will be too slow to optimize a big neural net with this objective. So we still need to do a little bit more work. And one way in which we could remedy this uh, computational intractability, this, 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 this problem with high computational cost is to introduce an additional idea, which is going to be slicing. So slicing is, again, a general technique that's used in many machine learning algorithms. It's the idea of doing random projections on one dimensional vectors. So uh, in, 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 intuitively, if you look at this objective, it involves, um, it's, it's computationally expensive to compute the gradient when uh, the output, when the input and the output of X is high dimensional. But if we were in low dimensions, this objective would be computable and tractable. Therefore, we could try to make it low dimensional by projecting everything into a low dimensional subspace. In particular, we could project it into a one dimensional subspace, which is going to be effectively a slice of the input space, which is effectively, which is the reason why we call this process slicing and the resulting objective will be called sliced score matching. So first, I have a picture here which illustrates what slice score matching is doing. Here I have a vector field and I would like to match these arrows with, uh, I, I basically want to match these two vector fields. I want these two arrows to be the same. It is computationally expensive to do this in high dimensions. However, 
I could choose certain slices, which in, the, which in this case are just lines through the input space. And then I can project every line here into, into this slice, which means that instead of looking at the full arrow, I just look at one of the components of this arrow. I just look at the component that's parallel to this, to this line. And so now, instead of matching these arrows, I'm just going to try to match them along the direction of the slice that I have chosen. So this is my slice. And I'm going to optimize, I'm going to match these arrows only along the direction of the slice. And similarly, here in this other example, I have a different slice, right? Now I have this diagonal slice. And if I were to look at every arrow, it has a component along this direction. And therefore, I can also try to match these arrows along that direction. Right, and if if I can if I can match these vector fields along every slice, then I have effectively made the two vector fields the same. So that's the idea. Instead of trying to match high dimensional vectors or high dimensional arrows, let's match one dimensional arrows in a random projected one dimensional space that we choose. That we choose at random. So okay, th this was the intuition. How do we actually do this? Well, we can extend our objective to something called slice score matching, which defines something called the sliced Fisher divergence. Okay, so this is the formula of uh, the formula for the sliced Fisher divergence, and you you can notice that this is effectively the regular Fisher divergence, except that I have this extra term here where I sample random slices v. So v is a projection vector that's sampled from some distribution Q of V that we choose, you can think of it as just being, it could be a uniform distribution over, over vectors. And instead of projecting, um, you know, instead of measuring the L2 distance between the true score and the model score, I instead measure the L2, I measure the square of the difference of their projections onto V. Okay, so now I have defined an extension of the Fisher divergence over slices. This is also a valid objective for minimizing a, uh, for optimizing a score function. Uh, so your question was, do we choose one V or do we choose all the Vs? So in general, we use all the Vs and in general, we average over, over all the possible Vs, but in practice, we will approximate the expected value over V by random sampling, uh, by Monte Carlo, which means we will take random samples from Q of V. Yeah, if this was to be optimized using gradient descent, then similarly to how we take a mini batch of uh, Xs from the data distribution, we would also take a mini batch, oh, well, we would, we, we would take a V, we would take a random V for each data point in our mini batch, and then at the next step of gradient descent, when we take a different mini batch, we would take a different set of Vs. Okay, so this is an extension of the Fisher divergence. However, it still has the problem that we don't know P data. This was an extension of the original Fisher divergence, which uses slicing. Therefore, to make things tractable, we again have to use the same change your variables trick that I used to rewrite the original sliced Fisher divergence. And this gives us now a sliced score matching objective, which has, which has this form. And again, you can notice that everything that's in the square brackets has been rewritten to no longer include the score function of the true distribution. Everything within the square brackets only involves our model which is tractable, um, and this is effectively the same formula as the score matching objective, except that we are projecting everything into, into the slice of V. And so previously, this term here was complicated to deal with, uh, so we had to compute a 
we, we had to differentiate the Jacobian of the score function. Now we no longer have to do this. We project everything down into one dimension and then we deal with this in one dimension. Sorry, yeah, we, pr we project the score function into one, uh, and sorry, uh, sorry, I'm, I, I, said, I said this wrong. Actually, this was the term that was complicated and we, we basically project down this matrix into a scalar by taking the dark product with V on both sides. Question. The question is what is V and does it always have to be one hot? I think you would want to avoid it being one hot because you wanna average all of the components of the objects that you're projecting down. You, you would rarely want this to be one hot. I think if it was to be one hot, you would have a higher variance than with other choices. So the answer is that you should not use in practice one hot vectors. It will theoretically work, but in practice it will give you a higher variance estimator of the true gradient. In practice, uh, choosing a multivariate standard normal is something is probably the most common thing that 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 anyone would use here. Uh, or as an alternative, Rademacher uh, noise, which means that each entry of v is plus one or minus one at random. That could also be another option. Uh, but I think choosing it to be one hot would be worse because that would, well, you would be averaging over a smaller number of vectors, only the basis vectors, and you would also have higher variance. Okay, so now we have defined a new objective that is finally tractable and that has, uh, yeah, it's, it's tractable. It approximates a principled objective called the slice Fisher divergence. And therefore, if we, uh, this objective can be analyzed uh, mathematically and shown to have uh, properties of consistency. And, uh, and by that, I mean, if you optimize this objective, given enough data, given a good enough model, you will recover the true score function. So there is also helpful theory that explains this is a good and valid objective for us to use. Okay, so we went from the Fisher divergence, which was intuitively plausible, it made sense, but it was intractable for several reasons. One is just pure computability, and the other one was scalability, and we came up with two solutions. Uh, we, we came up with, first we reformulated the Fisher divergence as a score matching objective, and then we made it more tractable by introducing slicing. So this is one way in which a score function could be learned. This is one valid objective for a score function. And there's another way uh, that is also important that I will show briefly on the next slide. And so at the end of this part of the lecture, we will have this objective and the other one that's gonna be on my next slide that will form two valid learning objectives for a score-based uh, score general model. Uh, asymptotic normality means that uh, you, um, is that the error will be distributed only across the, uh, for, with finite data, your error will be approximately normal. Okay, so this was one way of uh, learning a score function, but that's actually not the only objective that's used. And in score-based generative models, there's also the option of using another objective, which is called denoising score matching. And denoising score matching is going to be another way of approximating, of approximating this intractable Fisher divergence. In slice score matching, we try to rewrite the objective using this uh, integration by parts trick in order to obtain a, um, in order to obtain an exact approximation, uh, sorry, in order to obtain an approximation to the exact distribution. In denoising score matching, instead we have a trick for learning exactly without slicing the gradient of a noise, the gradient of a noised version of the, uh, sorry, the score function of, an, of the noised version of the data distribution. So what do I mean by a noise version of the data distribution? 
let's say that we have clean data X and we somehow corrupt the clean data, for example, by perturbing it with Gaussian noise. And this is how we get a new data, uh, a, a new set of data points, X tilde. So for each X tilde, we take the original X and then we take some random, some random noise epsilon and we append and we add that noise to our X uh, and the amount of noise is controlled by this extra parameter sigma. So this is a noising process that introduces, yeah, that introduces noise into my clean data X. So the idea of score matching is that while it's typically hard to learn or, well, yeah, it can be hard for the reasons that we just saw to learn the score function of the clean data. There is an efficient technique for learning a score function of the noise data. And so the idea of denoising score matching will be to, instead of trying to learn the gradient of the, uh, instead of learning the score function of the clean data, we're going to try to learn a, we're going to try to learn the score function of corrupted data. And then hopefully we're gonna be able to reduce sigma gradually to get back a cleaner distribution. So this is an alternative approach. Uh, that this can be seen as an alternative to slice score matching. If we want to learn a score, we could either use slice score matching or we could use denoising score matching to learn an approach. We could use slice score matching to learn, to try to learn the score of the true distribution, or we could try to use denoising score matching to learn the score of a noisy approximation to the true function. And this one will be a bit, the advantage of this one is that it's a bit faster in practice. And also I, I, I'm gonna define the formula in, in a moment, but there's, I guess there's a few questions. Uh, sorry, when you say the noise version, like are we the ones applying? Yeah. Noise? Like we know the exact yeah. parameters of- Yeah, like, we choose the noise. Okay. And this is gonna be a general technique for learning the score function of any noise distribution. There was another question. There's another question on Zoom. Uh, yeah, could it be something like applying like a box filter or like bilateral filter instead of a, like Gaussian noise? Uh, most likely, yes. I don't remember off the top of my head of the exact restrictions on what the noise is uh, and what the noise can be, uh, but this applies beyond just Gaussian noise, yes. But I think there, have, there has to be some randomness though. So I, if I, if I remember correctly, I think it has to be, I'm not 100% sure if it can be deterministic. I think it has to be random. But uh, other types of noises could also work here. Okay, so what is the noising score matching? Here I have defined a noised version of the data distribution called Q of sigma. And then what denoising score matching says, so denoising, oops, denoising score matching is saying that if we wanted to approximate the Fisher divergence between the model and the score, uh, between the model and the score of the noise data, then we can easily rewrite this in a slightly different form where, where instead of computing the L2 norm between the model and the true score, we compute the, the the, the L2 norm between the score and this other version of the model and, and this other mathematical object, which looks very similar, but is actually different. It's the score of the conditional log probability of X tilde where the conditioning is on X. And so in practice, we first sample a point from X, then we sample a noised version X tilde and now we take the gradient of the log probability of X tilde given X. And this by a, an argument that's really similar to that trick that I showed you earlier in one dimension, 
that equals the original Fisher divergence. Or, mm, sorry, I should, it equals plus constant terms which are not important for um, optimization. Okay, so, and, and, and again, the point here is that while this original uh, entity could be hard to compute, the conditional, the, the, the score of the conditional distribution of X tilde, where it's conditioned on X, that is typically easy to compute. It has an easy form. For example, when X tilde is perturbed with Gaussian noise, this is the exact formula for what X is. It's just the residual noise between X and X tilde. Um, and so now we have an objective that's tractable. We don't have to apply the same change of variables trick and we don't have to apply slicing. This does not have the problems we had earlier. This is just the L2 norm between two vectors that we know. One of them is our model, and the other one is typically given by a simple formula, like the one that I highlighted here. Therefore, we can just optimize this L2 loss. And so this is an alternative approach. In practice, this can be faster and work better than slice or matching, right? So it's faster, but the problem is that it can only learn noise distribution. So we couldn't hope to apply this by gradually bringing down our noise and make it smaller, um, but when applied, like this without any modifications. This also has the problem that the variance of the resulting gradient estimator will start to increase as we make sigma square smaller, right? So right, clearly sigma square can't be zero in this example because then we'll be dividing by sigma square, we'll be dividing by zero in that number. So sigma square can't be zero when it becomes close to zero, there are the variance of the resulting gradient estimator, the variance of the resulting yeah, gradient estimator will increase, but the hope is that we could still gradually anneal sigma, and in practice, this could still work for interesting applications. All right, so to summarize things, I have defined an objective for doing score matching, which is based on the Fisher divergence, and I have reformulated that objective to make it practical in two ways. One of them was slice score matching, the other one was denoising score matching, right? And so in summary, we have the following algorithm that we can use to learn a score-based generative model, right? Let's say our goal is to learn a model like this one, S of X, of the score of the data distribution. And then what we can do is, given an initial guess for the parameters of these models, we sample a batch of training points, and then we compute the gradient of either the slice score matching objective, which is here, or the gradient where for the slicing score matching objective, I use some random set of projection vectors, or I could use a noised version uh, with some noise level sigma. And so I minimize this objective. Both of these are tractable objectives that can be meant. You can, you, can, you can optimize these in PyTorch in a straightforward way. Uh, so you obtain a gradient, and then you take a step on that gradient. Uh, and you keep doing this. So this is the full algorithm for learning a score-based generative model that involves either of our two objectives. And this model, S of X, it can be anything, it's typically chosen to be a unit, uh, if you know what that is. Uh, so it can be a very flexible type of neural network. Okay, so now I defined my full algorithm and I will conclude with some examples of what you can do once you have learned S of theta, S sub theta of X. Uh, I think there was a question. So there is no theta within Q because Q is not part of our model. Q is the noise, the, Q is the distribution that we're gonna eventually learn. Instead of learning the score function of P, we're gonna learn the score function of Q and Q is gonna be a noised version of the original distribution. So this technique does not allow you to learn of the true data, the score function of the true data distribution, it lets you learn the score function of a noised version of the data distribution. And that's what Q is, yeah. And sigma is a, no, is a noising parameter that we get to choose. In this case, it's the strength of the Gaussian noise that we have. 
Okay, all right, so now I have given you a full algorithm for learning a score-based generative model. Let's now see how we can do this, how we can use this to do something useful. In particular, can we use this to generate samples? So how do we do this? The intuition is that if we have a score function, the score function, as I said earlier, it's a vector field that tells us where we have to go in order to increase the probability, the, 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 yeah, in order to make our probability larger. So if we want to sample high probability data points, what we could do is we could start with random data points and then move along this gradient field with some random noise added in to reach points where the data, where the value of the probability is high. So in other words, once we have the score function, we can take samples by following where the arrow, by, by starting somewhere at random and following where the arrows are pointing us to go. And this process is called Langevin dynamics, right? So we start with some random noise and then we follow the score function, which is the gradient of the data distribution. We follow the gradient, which tells us where the data distribution becomes, has more mass. We follow it in those regions until we have something which looks like a point with high probability under the data distribution. So that's the intuition of Langevin dynamics. And so specifically, Langevin dynamics is a particular MCMC sampling process that is designed to take samples from a distribution of which we only know the score, okay? And the way it works is as follows. We start with some random guess for X. We're gonna call this X zero. It comes from the noise distribution. <clears throat> and then we follow a sequence of T steps where at each step we random, we, we, we sample some Gaussian noise and then we take a step along where our gradient is pointing us. So we start with our, oops, we start with our previous guess for what X is and we add to it this gradient plus some noise. So effectively, this formula is just gradient ascent on the log probability with extra noise added in. And alpha here, this parameter alpha, that's just our step size. So one way to think about what Langevin dynamics is doing is gradient ascent on the log probability, okay? Um, and you can show that this works, so it can be seen as gradient ascent, and you can show that it works, it's guaranteed to produce samples from our probability P of X if you anneal alpha in the right way as t goes to infinity, alpha gradually goes to zero, and if you do this at the correct rate, you can mathematically show that this will give you a valid sample from your data distribution. The, the reason why you have this particular noise with this particular term, square root of alpha t, and then alpha t has to satisfy a certain property. The math becomes more complicated, but the short answer is it has to be random for you to generate samples. Otherwise, you just find them all. If you, if you run an, an infinite number of steps of Langevin, an infinite number of runs of Langevin dynamics, and you take the resulting samples, then the distribution of these samples will look like the distribution that you're trying to sample from. In principle, yes, this is just saying that you have, in order for this to work, at least theoretically, you just need to have the gradient of the log probability. So if you have a model, in particular, if you have some kind of model which approximates the true log, the true score function, then you can plug in that model and have and take samples from the distribution that you want, assuming your model is good enough. And either of these objectives can give you something which approximates the true log, uh, the true score function, right? Um, so that's the short answer. But there is actually a slightly longer answer to your question. Um, uh, so this is just, okay. The, 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 there is actually a more complicated answer to your question. And this depends, so this question involves a fact from machine learning called the manifold hypothesis, okay? So 
it bas basically the problem is that what I said is correct in theory, but it's not always correct in practice because, that, because of the, the fact that the data that we're trying to model has some peculiarities. Uh, and in particular, Langevin dynamics, in order for it to work, <clears throat> the score function has to be defined at every point of the input space X. But with a lot of the data that we're interested in modeling, such as image data, you can argue that the score function would actually be, you know, the true score function will be undefined in most places of the input space. So what do I mean by this? The reason why this will be true is because of this hypothesis, which is, you can, you can, you can heuristically study it and show that it's actually, it seems to be true in many cases. This hypothesis says that the data that we're dealing with, that we're working with, this high dimensional data like images, doesn't uniformly, doesn't live, is not uniformly distributed along the space of X's. So the, X, the X's that are images are not uniformly distributed in the space of all possible tensors of a certain dimension. They're distributed on a subspace, in fact, on a small subspace of all the possible vectors and tensors that we could have. Right, so this is what I have here. Uh, in this example, I have a few data points, but these data points, they live on this kind of one dimensional manifold, which is a Mobius strip within a, uh, sorry, within this two dimensional manifold, which is a Mobius strip in the three dimensional space. Or to make it a little bit more practical, let's say that we are working with digits. Let's say we're working with MNIST digits. These are 784 dimensional vectors. But the space of digits is much lower dimensional than 784. In fact, if you just take PCA and you project down from something like 784 to 600, there is virtually no degradation at all in pixel quality. The, the images are completely unchanged if you throw away a big portion of the dimensions. So the data lives in a much, much lower dimensional subspace than the full dimensionality of the data, which in this case is 784. And because the data just doesn't live at all in certain portions of the space, the score function is not defined in those regions, right? If there are regions of the input space where the probability of the data is zero, therefore, then, you know, for those x's, the log probability is not, def the, is not defined and the gradient of log probability is also not defined. This is, this is called the manifold hypothesis, okay? Um, so we have this practical problem. So this figure illustrates what the problem is, right? In our two-dimensional example, we have a mode of the data distribution here and a mode of the data distribution here, but the data doesn't really live in this region. Therefore, if we were to try to estimate the score function, we would, it, would, it would either be undefined here or we would not even, or, or, or we would have very, very little data in the region to estimate the score function. And this is a problem because if we were to try to start this process from random noise, which could live in this inaccurate region, then there is no way for us to start with this random noise and reach the accurate regions. So this is a problem. This, this manifold problem is something that will, in practice, break all of the math that I described earlier. So the solution that we're gonna use to solve this problem is to add noise to the data, is to smooth the data distribution. For example, if we, if we were to somehow blur or perturb the density such that it covers more of the data distribution, for example, if I were to start with a data set and I were to expand, I were to apply some kind of Gaussian blur, then we would get something which looks like this. We, I would have two modes, and these modes would cover most of the space. Therefore, the score function will be accurate in most places, right? So the score function will be well-defined everywhere, but now we have a different distribution. So that's a problem. Um, so there's a trade-off, right? We could apply more noising and more smoothing to get back 
to, to, to make learning the score easier. But then in the process of doing this, we changed the, the, the data distribution, which is bad. And so the solution to this will be what I'm gonna call multi-scale noise. Instead of just learning the score for either the clean data or some noise data, we're going to perturb the data using a number of these levels. We're gonna perturb it at, with increasing level, levels of noise. And we're going to learn a model for each type of noise level. And when we sample, we're going to anneal the noise. We're going to start by taking samples from the highly noise distribution, then from the less noisy, the less noisy, and so on. And this is a process that is going to be called annealed important sampling. So in order to perform annealed important sampling, we need something which is, uh, we need a slight extension to our model. Instead of, um, so uh, as I said, we now need a score function for the clean data, as well as the various noise distributions, which are going to be with noise sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. So in order to do this, we're going, we're going to augment our model with an additional parameter sigma, which is the level of noise that we have. We, we refer to this model as a noise conditional score network. So now, instead of just predicting the score function of the data distribution, our model will be trained to predict the score function of the distribution with some level of noise sigma, and we get to choose this level of noise. So that's S of X of sigma. And in practice, the same neural net will parameterize all these noises. The sigma will just be an extra input to the noise conditional network. So we use the same set of weights, right? So the same model is trained for all sigma and the parameters are shared across noise levels. And so if, if we were to now apply this with the noise score matching, we would have our usual denoised score matching objective, which is here, but we would also average it over all the various noise levels that we see, right? So this is how we can train a noise conditional network. And once we have a noise conditional network, we can apply uh, annealed Langevin dynamics. And basically what annealed Langevin dynamics is, uh, it's that you start with a high level of noise sigma, and then you start with a lot of points which are all over the place. Initially the random noise, but because we have so much noise, the score function is defined everywhere for this wrong data distribution, but it's still defined everywhere. Therefore, after we run Langevin dynamics for, 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 for this noise level sigma one, our data points will move a little bit closer to the modes. It will not be the true distribution, but they will move a little bit closer to where we want. Now we can reduce the noise. So now the points will start to concentrate even more around these modes. And then as we slowly anneal sigma, the points converge where we want. And then when we have a low level of sigma, we are going to be performing Langevin dynamics with the true data distribution and with points X zero, which are already generated close to these modes. And therefore we will reach the value that we want, right? So this is the intuition of Langevin dynamics and the pseudocode is just here. Uh, again, it's the same as regular Langevin dynamics, except that I have, oops, except that I have um, so, so the, the inner loop here is regular Langevin dynamics, but there's an extra outer loop where we iterate over all the possible noises sigma. All right, and then I'll just end here by saying that when you combine all of these things together, they give you really good samples. So score-based general models have been introduced around, well, I guess their most recent iteration was, in, was uh, published in 2019. Uh, and they were, and then they were refined in some, in a few ways, which I will talk about in the next lecture, but uh, this approach and its modern versions are able to yield very high sample quality and a sample quality that's comparable to that of GANs, but without relying on this unstable uh, objective that involves both the discriminator and the generator. Um, and so in practice, what's interesting about these models is that they work by uh, generating images from noise. So in a score-based generative model, we, well, when we train this model, 
when we add these different levels of noise, we create these increasingly noised images. And then when we perform annealed Langevin dynamics, we start with complete noise, and then we gradually, out of noise, so from this Gaussian noise, we gradually sample images which are increasingly less noisy. And this process can be thought of as a form of iterative refinement. Okay. So that's an interesting fact about how these samples are generated when you actually run anneal Langevin dynamics. So to summarize, we saw this new type of generative model called score models, which can be used to, to produce really high quality samples with stable training, and they can effectively train a, an energy-based model. You can effectively use them to train an energy-based model without worrying about the partition function. But there are some problems. Sampling is slower than in GANs because you have to use this slow, well, relatively slower Langevin MCMC process, which you have to run typically for thousands of steps. And it still doesn't solve some of the problems that we talked about, such as density estimation or likelihood estimation. And it still doesn't have latent variables in it. So it produces good samples, but it doesn't solve some of these general modeling tasks. And so in the next lecture, we're going to look at an extension of this called diffusion models, which will address some of these cons while keeping the main advantages.